Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank for this invitation. It's a great honor. And I also enjoy the very beautiful location in which our uh, uh, meeting takes place. Uh, this area, this topic of religion and politics is so vast that I think, given the fact that the speakers have about 30 minutes, uh, one has to be very selective. So I decided not to select a particular, let's say, geographical case, as Alan Wolf will do in speaking mainly about the United States, but one very specific question, the question that is called, does modernization lead to secularization? So although I think that this question is a very clear one, unfortunately, both concepts contained in the formulation of the question are not completely unambiguous. Neither secularization nor modernization are concepts that have absolutely clear, fixed meanings. So let me start very briefly just uh, explaining uh, how I use these concepts. I do not say everybody has to use them in exactly the same ways. I just want to make clear what my question is. The notion of secularization has, I think, at least seven different meanings. And part of the misunderstandings and problems and discussions about this topic are a consequence of different people using different meanings of the, of the concept. I count at least seven. The original, the fundamental layer of meaning with regard to the concept of secularization is clearly legal. The original meaning that has almost been forgotten is that canon laws spoke of secularization when a member of, religious, of a religious order became a regular priest. In the early 19th century, or already in the late 18th century, another legal meaning was added to this one, namely the expropriation of church property. It's transferred mostly to the state. For example, in German history, in 1802-1803, we speak, and that's a crucial point in German uh, history, of the secularization, the year of secularization. So I will not really deal with these two meanings. Now, in the 19th century, again, on top of these le two legal meanings, there developed a philosophical and theological discourse about secularization. It's, it has two main versions, I would say. One belongs more to Protestant theology, a kind of optimistic hope that Christianity will now, under modern conditions, permeate modern culture and the modern state more and more so that a point might be reached in the future when a separate institution called church will no longer be necessary. That's exclusively a view in Protestant theology. Nobody in Catholic theology could have imagined such a future. But you also have a second kind of critical or negative version of this philosophical and theological discourse, namely people saying that it is clear that some traits of the modern state and modern culture have their genealogical roots in Christianity, but that is exactly the reason why the modern state has to get rid of these Christian traces that are still around. And the third now, the third disciplinary context, one could say, is the social sciences in the 19th, 20th, and also 21st century, but with again three different ways to use the concept of secularization. The first, I, and I have to be very brief of course, but the first would be something like decline of religion. The second would be something like retreat of religion from the public sphere into the private sphere, a meaning where I would prefer to use the notion of privatization, but some people use the concept of secularization for that. And the third is a change of attitude on the side of religious believers and on the side of religious institutions in the sense of that they release societal spheres from religious controls, that they accept, so to speak, that the economy, 
or the state or art or science are in some connection with religion but are not directly controlled by religious presuppositions. Even this distinction of three different social scientific meanings is too easy still because, for example, when we say decline of religion, what exactly do we mean by decline? Do we mean a decline of membership? Or do we mean really a decline of the number of people who have certain religious attitudes? Do we mean a decline of participation in religious rituals? We could only neglect such differentiations if the developments in these, on these different levels went in a parallel manner, but they don't. We all know that people can remain members of churches but lose their faith. Uh, for example. So in my talk today, I will concentrate on one of these seven meanings, namely the meaning of secularization in the sense of decline of religion. Now very briefly also on the other main concept here, namely modernization. Unfortunately, this is also a rather difficult concept. I see two different ways the dominant the intellectual landscape, so to speak. One is treating the concept of modernization as a kind of transition to a new epoch called modernity. When you ask people who use the concept of modernization in such a way, when exactly this epoch of modernity has begun, you get a very bewildering array of answers. I could say, I know people who say yes, let's say around 1492 when Christopher Columbus discovered America and others answering that around 1910 when Vasily Kandinsky invented abstract painting. So I personally think that a concept is rather useless that can be used in such different ways. So I personally do not use the concept of modernization in the sense of a transition to an epoch called modernity, but in a more innocent way as the name of a kind of continuous, open-ended process of economic growth and of technological and scientific progress that is connected with this economic growth, partly as its cause and partly as its consequence. So I can now, at the end of this brief introduction, reformulate the question that I put in the title of my talk, does modernization lead to secularization? So the question is, do economic growth and the technical and scientific progress connected with it lead to a decline of religion? Now, to be pedantic, when I say lead to, what I mean necessarily lead to, quasi-automatically lead to such a decline of religion, that it sometimes can be combined with such a decline, nobody can deny. But does this process of economic, technical and scientific change necessarily and automatically and perhaps a last specification here, irreversibly lead to such a decline or lead to an irreversible decline because the proponents of the secularization thesis clearly do not mean that we are just experiencing a sort of momentary decline of religion after which a new increase of religiosity will happen but they see this as a kind of definitive irreversible progress that will lead to the disappearance of uh, religion from the surface of this planet. Now, let me, in discussing this secularization thesis, now very briefly talk about, first talk about three aspects of it. Why should that be the case? Who had this assumption and since when? Let me start with the question, who actually had this assumption? from one of the best books, I think, in the sociology of religion, 
a book by the Spanish-American sociologist Jose Casanova, I can quote a list of names of 19th century intellectuals and scholars like Karl Marx, John Stuart Mill, Auguste Comte, Herbert Spencer, Edward Tyler, James Fraser, Ferdinand Tönnies, Georg Simmel, Emil Durkheim, Max Weber, Wilhelm Wundt, Sigmund Freud, Lester Ward, William Sumner, Robert Park, George Herbert Mead, and so on and so on. You get the message probably. What I want to say is practically everybody in the middle, the second half, and maybe the first half of the 20th century, who played an important role in the social sciences, in the humanities, in philosophy, and in general intellectual life. Some people are even missing from this list, who are particularly important here, like Friedrich Nietzsche, who was one of the, let's say, most vehement critics of uh, Christianity, and of course, all the Marxists. Only Marx appears on the list, but all the Marxists shared this uh, attitude and what could go on and say even some believers like the Protestant Austrian American sociologist of religion Peter Berger in a famous article in the New York Times in 1968 predicted that in the year 2000 there will be only very small groups of lonely believers left in an ocean of secularity that will only survive huddled together as he said or Jürgen Habermas, who is probably the most influential German intellectual of the last decades, in his main work in the early 80s, the theory of communicative action certainly represented one of the most radical versions of a secularization theory, which he has only recently begun to revise. It is really difficult to find exceptions. There are some exceptions, like in America, William James or Alexis de Tocqueville, but I don't have to go through that. So the secularization thesis, extremely influential in the 19th and 20th centuries. When did it come up? Again, very, very briefly, and I do not claim to have the definitive answer to this question. I would get, like to get more information about it, so to speak. Uh, the earliest case that has so far been identified, I think, is in the very early 18th century. People, English deists, early Enlightenment thinkers, predicting that after about 200 years, Christianity or all religion will have disappeared, at least in Europe. There are other, there's other evidence of this kind in the correspondence between the Prussian king, Frederick II, and Voltaire, or in Thomas Jefferson's writings who expected all in the year 1822 all young men at that point alive in the United States to be Unitarians at the time of their death. Please do not misunderstand me. I do, I'm not speaking here about the history of atheism, but about, so most of these people are not militant atheists, so to speak, but about the expectation that Christianity in Europe at least, and maybe in North America, will more or less die out just uh, out of itself. But now the most important aspect here, of course, is why? Why were people so sure that this will happen? And the first surprising fact that one has to state when one asks this question is that most of these authors do not develop an elaborate argument to make their point. I mean, you could expect them, this is such an extremely important point, that they develop complex causal theories, so to speak, wh why modernization necessarily leads to an irreversible process of secularization. But they don't. So what we can do in such a case is only to uncover the implicit assumptions in their thinking that led them to this theory or to this thesis. Some people deny that one should even call it a theory because it is not elaborate. So sometimes I call it only the secularization thesis and not the secularization theory. Now, on the basis of my own attempts to interpret these implicit assumptions about Christianity, about religion, about faith, I would distinguish three types here. Three assumptions that made it look evident to these authors that secularization takes place. The first I call something like 
excuse the expression, a cognitivist misunderstanding of faith. If you think that religious faith is just a kind of cognition, that means a type of knowledge, but an immature form of knowledge, a pseudo solution of cognitive problems, then it becomes completely logical to assume that in the course of scientific progress, faith will disappear. It was the immature, the uncertain type of knowledge, and it will now be replaced by a more mature, more certain type of knowledge. This is, of course, completely misguided with regard to faith and religion. If you just look at the etymology of the concepts like belief, faith, and so on in most languages, the etymological root is not cognition. The etymological root is much closer to things like trust and love. So we would have, I don't have the time to do that now, but I think one has to develop an alternative understanding of faith, so to speak, to counter this cognitive misunderstanding of what religion is all about. Second, if you see religion as the expression of miserable conditions, it becomes logical to assume that if these miserable conditions are overcome, then religion will disappear. That's, of course, at the core of the Marxist assumptions about the future of religion. If religion is the result of poverty, social inequality, social repression, so in the uh, utopian society, communist society, all this will have disappeared and religion together with it. But the Marxist version is only one. In the 19th century, and I think increasingly today again, there are also forms that were called in the 19th century medical materialism. That means it's less social inequality and social repression, but for example, a short life expectancy. So the constant confrontation with death and death anxiety, so that a longer life expectancy then leads to less need for religion. And there are other versions. The most sophisticated is perhaps in the work of Max Weber, who was thinking not so much in medical or material terms, but as a kind of internal need for meaning and developed a theory why under modern conditions it becomes more and more difficult to develop such an internal existential meaning. Again, I don't have the time to develop a full-fledged critique of that and present an alternative to it. Again, I will only mention two very short points here, namely this whole hypothesis of insecurity as the basis for faith ignores what many believers profess, so to speak, namely that gratitude for them is an important experience of self-transcendence, that they do not get to their faith so much out of need, so to speak, but out of a feeling of abundance. And, of course, we cannot simply assume that need is given without any a priori process of sensitization to what need and uncertainty mean. So faith sensitizes people to problems in the world and is not simply an interpretation of already experienced problems in the world. And the third implicit assumption, perhaps the most explicit you could say, because the two others are really very implicit, is that faith presupposes authoritarian structures, mostly in education, but often also in politics, and cultural homogeneity. I have experienced that quite uh, frequently in discussions that people think if there is something like a democratization of education and increased cultural heterogeneity, faith will disappear. So it, again, I don't have the time to go into details here, but I want to end this section of my talk by saying I think the secularization thesis in all its versions is based on an inadequate understanding of 
the perspective of believers on their faith, on an inadequate understanding of religious experience and of the interpretation of religious experience. Now let me immediately switch to the other section of this talk, namely, so a discussion of the secularization assumption, I think, has to take place on both levels. This was one level, namely what do we mean when we say religion, when we say faith. But the other level is of course the sociological empirical level, namely can we really observe a causal connection between modernization and secularization. Now for the purposes of this talk, let me at least in the beginning here, I mean don't worry, in the beginning of this section, yeah, not of this talk, uh, more or less ignore the European case. Let me grant, so to speak, to the secularization theorists that there are dramatic cases of secularization in Europe. But how do we deal with the exceptions? How do we explain what secularization theorists call exceptions, namely non-secularized societies under modern conditions? So very briefly, we have European exceptions. The most famous, of course, in the literature, always quoted in the literature, is Poland. But there are others like Ireland, Croatia, the part of Bavaria where I uh, come from. There is a typical explanation for these so-called exceptions, namely that religion survived under modern conditions where religious identities were fused with national identities or regional or ethnic identities. I mean, it's easy to illustrate. You, everybody knows that for the Poles, their Catholicism was an important means also to defend their own identity against the Protestant Prussians and against the Orthodox and later Stalinists, Communist Russians or Soviets. I would not deny that this played an important role in all these European exceptional cases, but what I deny is that religion in these cases is merely a remainder from a pre-modern past. That's the perspective of the secularization theorists. They think wherever modernization takes place, religion disappears under some specific conditions Religion is kind of preserved. It remains a pre-modern phenomenon that is preserved under the modern conditions. And that is wrong. Religion in these cases is a modern phenomenon, although we cannot always see that immediately because it is sometimes the result of a process that has been called retraditionalization. You know, that, for example, movements for national independence mobilize religious identities together with their ethnic identities under modern uh, conditions. And I think a similar thing happens in many Islamic countries at the moment. The second step in a kind of logical sequence here would be to accept the exceptional case of the United States. Now, I think I should leave that more or less to Alan's uh, presentation. But let me just briefly say, I think nobody denies, although one can have all sorts of controversies about precise numbers, that the United States is much more religious than most European societies. But nobody denies either that the United States is a very modern society. So the American case has always been dealt with in the literature as the great riddle, so to speak, as the great exception. I will only mention here two explanations that have failed in my eyes and one explanation that I think leads us in the right direction. One of the failed explanations is similar to the explanation given to the Polish and Irish cases, namely that it is a kind of fusion of American national identity with a religious identity. Now, in this case, not Catholicism, of course, but the Purit Puritan, the Puritanical heritage. This, I think, has definitively 
uh, been repudiated by the results of empirical studies about re the religious history of the United States in the 19th and the first half of the 20th century. These studies have shown an increase in American religiosity over that period. Now, you could only, I think, adduce the heritage this is for a kind of delayed secularization process. So it would make sense to say, okay, all modern societies experience secularization. It's just a little bit delayed in the United States. But the direction is the opposite direction, or was at least the opposite, in the opposite direction. So that doesn't work. And the second failed explanation, I think, is that it was not the, Purit the heritage of the Puritans, but let's say the, the luggage of the immigrants that brought religion to the United States. So it would be the, the Irish and the Poles again, so to speak, that are also responsible for the high degree of religiosity uh, in the United States. But again, this does not work because on the basis of empirical research, we can say that immigrants very frequently became more religious after their migration to the United States than they were before in their European home countries. And Immigrants from the same ethnic origins did not become more religious when they migrated to other countries for, with, a more, with a stronger secular culture like, for example, Uruguay and Argentina. Uh, so it must be something in the United States that explains it, not migration and not simply a religious heritage. Now I think, but I will not elaborate on that, that the successful explanation has to do with the fact that the United States have not had a state-supported territorial monopoly of a religion since the late 18th century. They have not had a state-supported territorial monopoly. I think, I mean, you understand what this means. It is more or less characteristic for Europe that you had religious monopolies, territorial monopolies, that was the way out of the bloody religious conflicts of the post-Reformation period, and that you had not simply, let's say, religious homogeneity, but a state-supported and enforced monopolization. This is not the case for the history of the United States, so that you have religious pluralism, and to be very brief, I would say, but religious pluralism, not just as an empirical fact, but also as a kind of institutionalization of the value of religious plurality, which is different from mere religious pluralism. At least, let me try to find a language for this thought. Plurality and pluralism, so to speak. I mean, you can have many religious groups and associations without these people respecting this plurality as a value in itself. But you can have a set of institutions in which this is highly respected. This is seen as a value in itself. And I think that began in, the, in North America even before the foundation of the United States. The most, the hero of this story, a very important figure in the history of religious freedom for that reason, is the Puritan preacher Roger Williams, who had been in the 17th century religiously persecuted in Europe, as the others, migrated to North America and experienced there that some of the other Calvinists tried to establish a kind of theocracy there. And he said, but we are, he said, but we are the victims of religious persecution. We cannot do to others now what others did to us back in Europe. So he found, and that is why I am spending a minute with that, he found a kind of theological foundation for the idea of religious freedom. Since I have learned that I can only develop an authentic relationship to God under conditions of religious freedom, I have to want that all people, and not only all Protestants, but even the Catholics, which did not go without saying at the time, and as he said, even Turks, heathens, and Jews need religious freedom. 
So it's not true that the only path to the institutionalization of religious freedom goes through radical enlightenment. There is also a prototypically Christian path to religious freedom. Now I see that I'm running out of time, so I just mention what other parts of this talk could have contained. I think <laughs> after, after dealing with the European case and the North American case, of course any investigation of this relationship between modernization and secularization has to take a truly global perspective. Now in one sentence, if you look at the religious history of the world outside Europe and North America in the 19th and 20th century, you see all sorts of developments, but certainly not secularization as the typical result of modernization process. You see forms of redefinition of one's own religious heritage in mostly in Asian countries in view of Christian mission and economic and military expansion of Europe. Or you see a self-definition in a kind of antagonistic way that's more true for Islamic countries with regard to this expansion, but certainly not secularization. And of course, the next step would always be that is clearly necessary for all such discussions that we develop a kind of realistic view of the European religious past. Many theses about religious decline in Europe today are based on a complete overestimation of the religiosity in the European past. Uh, if you have a realistic view of that, if you see how uneducated, for example, the clergy often was, how often you find a kind of magical reinterpretation of the sacraments, which degree religious apathy, heterodoxy, popular anti-clericalism, which important roles they played in the European past, then the difference between the numbers, for example, those quoted by Wim van de Donk in his introduction, and European, I mean, this difference uh, looks less uh, dramatic. So let me now briefly end, because I know that there are, let's say, politicians in the audience, and they are not simply interested in explanatory questions. Does modernization lead to secularization? So the answer is no, but they will ask, uh, so what do we know when we know this? What are the practical conclusions we can draw for, from uh, this social scientific kind of reflection? So I draw three conclusions, and I will briefly, within one minute, read them to you. First, the assumption shared by radical secularists and anti-modern religionists that a strict separation of state and religion forces religion into the private sphere and leads in the long run not only to a privatization of religion but also to the decline of religion, this assumption is wrong. Radical secularists would welcome such a development. Anti-modern religionists abhor it, but the assumption is wrong. Religion can flourish under conditions of separation if, on the one hand, this separation encourages the participation of believers and of religious organizations in political life, and if, on the other hand, the believers and their organizations develop their own theological reasons for such a separation. Second, to the extent that the secularization thesis is a self-fulfilling prophecy, you understand, if people believe that in order to be modern, you have to get rid of religion, eh? they will not be willing to confess, so to speak, because they want to be seen as modern. So to the extent that this thesis is a self-fulfilling prophecy, the destruction of this prophecy will have consequences in religious life. Although I think we should not speak of a return of religion as if it had ever disappeared, and we should not conflate an increased attention paid to religion in the media with the religious change in itself, 
there are some indicators at the moment that indeed a changing cultural climate in Europe leads to a slight reversal of the secularizing trends that dominated the period since the 1960s. And thirdly and lastly, that's for me a very important point, religions as such don't act. It is always human beings who act, that is believers with a certain understanding of their faith but also with certain political goals, economic interests, and social characteristics. If we bear this in mind, we can immediately recognize all talk about a possible clash of religions or civilizations as misguided from the outset. It is therefore more fruitful to interpret them, some of the typical bones of contention in the current political and religious landscape, like headscarves or the full body veil, as symptoms of conflicts and not as indicators of the unassimilability of certain religions. As believers always have to ask themselves as to whether their articulation of their faith is still convincing to others, so secularists have to be willing to see signs of religious protest as indicators for a less than convincing appearance of the political and social order. Thank you.